Both the epistle and the gospel today tell us very insistently about the importance of forgiveness. Our Lord says that we're not even fit to worship him in his eyes if we have some outstanding grievance, that we should even postpone our most important duty of worshiping God in order to rectify that problem. Now, this is something very difficult for us to do. Our human nature is, is proud, it's sensitive to injuries, and we tend to hold grudges. So this is something that affects basically everyone to one extent or another. And for some people, this is a major obstacle in their spiritual life. And as a matter of fact, there are many, many people in hell right now who are there because they wouldn't forgive injuries. So this is one of the most common failings of our human nature, and this is why our Lord is so insistent about it. So let us consider today this, this vice of anger and hatred, and how we can fight against it in our souls. If we look around us on earth, at the rest of nature, we see that the animals generally live in peace with each other at least animals of the same species. Of course, a lot of animals are, are carnivorous, and so they eat other animals, and so they attack them. But between animals of the same species, for the most part, they live together in peace. And, and this is especially true of, of herd animals that, that live in packs or, or herds. Animals of the same herd or pack tend to work together. They tend to support each other and even protect each other. And if we look at the, the, the angelic kingdom, the world of the angels, we see kind of the same thing. Of course, the holy angels love God. They all work together in perfect harmony without any, any rivalry or any, any competition. But even the fallen angels, even the demons, of course, they have an intense hatred for each other. And they, they can't stand each other, but even... There, they overcome their hatred in order to work together towards a common goal, the common goal of bringing mankind to hell. So they cooperate, at least to that extent. So it seems like mankind is the only creature of God that can manage to live in some sort of peace with, with the other members of his kind. If we look around us at the world today, the world is full of people all fighting each other trying to take what others have, trying to exact revenge on, on everyone for every form of injury that can be done. And this causes a great disorder in the world. And it especially makes no sense when we consider that in the animal kingdom, the animals are born with some sort of weapon or defense measure that's built into their body. But man is not. Man is born without, without a horn, without tusks, without really long teeth or any form of poison or anything else that he could naturally use to attack other people. And he doesn't have a hard shell on his body or any form of defense. It's like man's body is designed to live in peace with his fellow man. So he is completely going against his nature when he fights with other people. And that is what our Lord is emphasizing in the Gospel today, that we are not supposed to fight. When we see people being angry or trying to get revenge on others, we really do see them acting more like animals than like men. The passion of anger is part of the animal part of our lower nature. It's, uh, it's uh, the part of our nature that we share in common with animals. And you really see this when, when people become angry and they're fighting. They are acting more like animals than human beings. They're acting even contrary to reason. But our nature is corrupted by original sin, and we do have a very strong inclination to follow our lower nature instead of reason. It's actually hard for us not to. So we have to remember a few things by, by faith whenever we are tempted to anger or revenge. First of all, we have to remember when someone does us an injury and we become angry, we have to remember 
how much more of an injury God has suffered from our sins. We have, in fact, inflicted a much greater injury on, on the honor of God than any human being could ever inflict on our own injury. There's no comparison between an offense to God and the, any offense to us. We have to keep a sense of perspective on, on what has happened to us. We should also think about how much our Lord has done for us. We have to be grateful for his, his dying on the cross for our sins. And we should remember how he treated us when we were his enemies. When we were his enemies, he, he suffered his, his terrible passion and death to atone for our sins. That is the example that we should follow. How We should look at how our Lord treats his enemies and treat our own in the same way. We should look also at how merciful he is towards us, even now, how much patience and forbearance he has towards the faults and offenses that we commit against him every single day, even now. And think about how much mercy he shows us when we come and and repent of our sins. He forgives us without any question, as long as we're sorry. So if God does that for us, how can we do any differently toward people who have done an injury to us that is much less in comparison? When we think that someone who has injured us doesn't deserve any forgiveness, we should remember how much forgiveness have we ever deserved from God. So how can we expect God to show nothing but mercy towards us while we expect perfect justice, and sometimes even more than justice, more than what is just, from someone that has offended us. And we say this in the Our Father. We say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So this is the price that God asks us to pay to him in order for us to obtain the forgiveness of our own sins. So how many people don't don't want to pay that price? They, They want all of their own sins forgiven, but... They don't, want, they don't want to pay the price. They want it just for free. But if we don't forgive our enemies, because we don't think that they're worthy of forgiveness, then, as our tells us here, we are not worthy of forgiveness before God. We think about the image that our Lord uses to explain this to us. He says that as long as we have not forgiven our brother, We can't offer a sacrifice to God. So this means that the anger that we have actually creates a wall between ourselves and God. So that our anger hurts us much more than it hurts our neighbor. We're only hurting ourselves, after all, when when we cut ourselves off from God. So let's say that someone does us some injury, and that's outside our control. We can't can't prevent that. But if we allow ourselves to become angry towards that person that has injured us and to want revenge and we don't forgive them, then we are hurting our own selves again after already being hurt by our neighbor. We're we're making our, our situation worse. We're cutting ourselves off from God, from his mercy. And that doesn't make any sense at all. In fact, it's completely contrary to common sense. We should also remember when we're angry at someone that the person that we're angry about is either a just man or a sinner. If he's a just man, if he's in sanctifying grace, then imagine what a terrible thing it is to have a hatred towards someone who is the friend of God. Well, what does that make us, obviously? It makes us God's enemy. But on the other hand, if the person that we're angry at is the enemy of God, if they're in mortal sin, then that means that we are becoming like that person, like we are becoming like our enemy in order to be angry at him or to wreak revenge upon him. Why should we want to become like someone who has injured us? That's in fact what we're doing. And if we take revenge on our neighbor and then he gets angry and then he takes revenge on us, and then we get even more angry, that also creates a vicious circle 
of violence. And if everyone gave in to that, pretty soon there would be no peace or order left in the world at all. A lot of times, when someone does us an injury, we tend to magnify the injury in our own minds. We tend to think that they were deliberately intending to hurt us, for example, which usually people aren't, or at least not to the extent that we usually believe. Another thing is that usually the injury that we suffer is not as severe as we think it is because we place an unrealistic value on, on what is taken from us. For example, if someone steals money from us or maybe damages our property, we tend to be more angry than we should be because we value material things more than we should. We should, have, we should be content to have a sufficiency of material things, but we shouldn't be so attached to our goods that if someone steals from us, we become uncontrollably upset, much less want revenge against them. Another example is that if someone does an injury to our good name or our reputation, it makes us very upset. But how many of us have a reputation that's not very accurate to begin with? Because most of us try to make people think that we're better than we really are because of our pride, our, our vanity. So when someone damages our good name and makes people think less of us than they did, what they're actually probably doing in most cases is just giving the people around us in our circle maybe a more realistic image of us. And that hurts our pride. But it's probably closer to the truth. And in a similar way, a lot of times when people do us injury, it's not really as serious as we think that it is. St. Paul tells us, be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That means that, yes, we can overcome evil that is done to us. We're not helpless, we're not defenseless. If someone does us an injury, we can overcome it. But do we do that by injuring them back? No, that's, that's not what he's saying. That only makes even more evil. He says the way we overcome evil is by good, by forgiveness, and by offering up to God what we have lost. And that is something that is more glorious and more pleasing to God than any, any prayer or penance that we could possibly do on our own. And that way it becomes something meritorious, and it, we, we truly overcome the evil. On the other hand, the worst thing we can do is just to give in to our passions and react just out of anger when someone injures us. A lot of times we'll tell ourselves that we have some right to be angry or to punish when we don't. And that very often leads people to do things that they regret later because they they did something very foolish under the influence of the passion of anger. If we want to overcome anger, we have to overcome an excessive love of ourselves so that our anger doesn't get out of control. As a practical rule, we have to have a strong resolution never to, to speak or to do any action at all when we're under the influence of anger. When we see that our emotions are getting worked up, we're losing our self-control, the only safe thing to do is to do and, and to say nothing until we calm down and, and our reason takes control again. There's a pagan historian who tells us an interesting story about a wise man once who went to visit a king. And before he left, the king asked him for some piece of wisdom, some wise advice that he had for him. So the wise man said to him that he should never do or say anything when he was angry, but when he became angry, he should wait until he said the whole alphabet all the way through in his mind and do nothing while he was, while he was saying that. Then hopefully by the time... He finished, by the time he got to the letter Z, he would have a better grip on himself so that he wouldn't do anything foolish. 
And that's very, very good advice, and, and we should do the same thing. In fact, the worst thing that we can do is to act out of anger. Because when our passions are in control, we almost always end up doing something very evil or very foolish. And this is true of, of all of our passions, not just the passion of anger. Another thing we should do is to just avoid thinking about things that make us angry. When some thought comes into our minds that reminds us of injuries or, uh, or things that we are upset about, we have to resist right away. All we should do is put the thought out of our mind completely and think about something else. We shouldn't argue with the thought. We shouldn't try to figure out if our anger is justified or not. We shouldn't try to analyze what happened and see if, if we're at fault or if the other person is at fault, if they meant to do what they did, or anything like that at all. We should just expel the thought completely out of our minds and think about something else. Another thing that we should do is that we should make an effort to try and cultivate a love for the person that has injured us. Of course, if we can do it without, without the thought making us angry, but if we can, we should, because opposites cancel each other out. If we think about some good things that this person has done to us, and if we try to focus more on, on their good qualities in our minds, that will negate the, the anger that we have towards that person. The virtue of forgiveness is something that is uniquely Christian. It's one of the it's one of the signatures of the followers of Christ. The Lord went so far as to say that this would be the sign by which we would be recognizable to the world. He said, By this shall the world know that you are my followers, that you love one another. So let us make this, this sign visible in our lives so that everyone can see it from a mile away. And let us let go of all of the, the petty resentments that are constantly getting between us and God and trying to, to rob us of God's mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.